Hello, hope you're all doing well. Coming to you from a hotel room in Calella in Spain. It's kind of a bit up the coast or down the coast from Barcelona. Um, so we got a yeah, few days training camp. We did like a weekend, like an outdoors weekend, and then pretty much came straight straight here for a few days of kind of warm weather pre-season training, which has gone pretty well so far. I did, uh, did some filming yesterday, so that'll be kind of probably next week's video. Some a nice speed session, a nice little showdown at the end with one of our new members. And then uh, today's video then is in June. I recorded a podcast with uh, the University of Staffordshire. It's called the University of Staffordshire High Performance Podcast with uh, doctors Paul Mansell and uh, Dr. Katie. And we're kind of just talking about kind of my ap approach to. Um, psychology and performing under pressure um so yeah so they they've been kind enough to give me the video so you can't see there's only one camera that was pointed at me so you can't see them during it you can just hear hear their voice so kind of some sometimes look a bit fidgety when they're talking but they were and I'm looking at them they were opposite side of the table but yeah that's going to be it for from me hope you enjoy the uh the podcast hope you kind of learn stuff some some of it hope, hopefully you can take something away and i'll uh, see you next week hi everybody and welcome to another episode of staffordshire university's performing under pressure podcast i'm your host today dr paul mansell and thank you to all our listeners whether you're joining us for the first time or whether you're a regular listener as you know what we try to do on this show is try to explore experiences of performing under pressure from those who have insight into that topic. Delighted today to be joined by co-host Dr. Katie Sparks in the studio. So welcome back, Katie. Thank you for having me, Paul. Just to start the ball rolling today, I just wondered if you had any reflections really on any recent guests that we've had in the studio or, or even ones going back to the very start that you've listened back to and it's made you think differently about something? I think um, looking at all kind of the ones that I've listened to and the ones that I've also been involved with, which have been great, um, it's kind of this realisation that um, individuals who either are facing big demands or under pressure are, are facing challenging situations, they already, a lot of them already have a lot of the skills without having an actual site telling them the skills. So they all kind of already have it, have it within them, which probably, which was probably has grown from coping with those situations. And also, I suppose it's a note back to our research and one of the stra one of the techniques we talk about but that thing about adding something into your stress bank into mm -hmm. the piggy bank to be able to then deal with stressful situations moving on i can see that resonating through some of the podcasts that we've gone through yeah i've seen that as well in some qualitative interviews that i've done with students in year 11 at school it seems to be the ones that are doing more things outside of school whether that's playing in a sport whether it's performing arts they seem to be the ones that have a better view of stress in general. So I'm absolutely with you on that, that prior experiences do seem to help people when it comes to these big moments. So without further ado, let's introduce today's guest. Delighted to welcome into the studio swimmer Jamie Ingram. So just to give you a bit of a rundown on Jamie's background, I've got a few kind of notes here to help me because there's quite a few achievements here. So Jamie has won a silver medal as a member of the men's 4x100 metre freestyle relay at the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. He's also won a silver medal in the 100 metre butterfly at the British Summer National Championships in 2023, competed in the Swimming World Cup twice and has been swimming at least national level for 12 years. So that's a bit of a, a rundown on some of Jamie's achievements. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here and... I've given a bit of background there into some of your achievements, but let's hear a little bit about you and your journey. So where did you grow up and how long have you been a swimmer for? I mentioned you've been at, at national level for 12 years, but how early did you start? And tell us what you've been up to in terms of your academic qualifications as well. Yeah, so I started started swimming as a as a kid, just in the, like you learn to swim at the leisure centre in uh, in Ripley, in, in Derbyshire. And then com completed all that kind of, yeah, go through all the lessons, finished the last one, and then said, oh, there's a, there's a swimming club in Ripley. Do you want to, like, they're having a trial on whatever whatever day, go and have a have a trial. And then, yeah, then they said, oh, yeah, 
come in, join the. We'd we'd, we'd, we'd like you in. So I was, I was uh, seven or eight then, and then uh, yes, yeah, so I'm with Ripley. And in in Derbyshire, we've got a uh, like a, a county squad. It's called Deventure XL. So that took kind of like the the best swimmers from all the small clubs around Derbyshire, and then gave them all a place to train together to, to kind of uplift Derbyshire swimming. Um, so there were a lot of people from Ripley that had, that had trained at, at Deventu at, at DX. So, so that was always like, a, right, how how good would it be to to get into DX and and be be able to swim there? And then eventually, yeah, when I was when I was twelve, just before I was thirteen, in, in, invited me there f- full time. And then, uh, yeah, was it was it Deventio for that have been till I was nineteen then, so the best part of seven years. And then went to Manchester for uni, where uh, studied. I've got a, I've got a master's in in maths, and then swam that whole time. Graduated 2022. That same same summer that I made the Commonwealth, it was then a good summer where I was Commonwealth, and then graduated. Well, kind of yeah. kind of wrap, wrapped up nicely. Now I've been kind of trying to trying to swim full time since in the past two years. Brilliant. And um, just to quickly press you on combining studying for a Masters and competing at an international level tournament. How did you find the balance between those two things? Uh, I, f- I found it all right. Like, su- surprisingly, it's not, not too bad. I think part of it was helped with um, with it being like the, that kind of year after the, all that COVID disruption, that all our materials were, were available then online. Mm. So, so this is for, the, for that ma- Masters year. Um, so it meant it's, it's it's quite easy then to access that when when is convenient for me, not necessarily being constrained to them those le- lecture times that we would have had the previous years. Um, but but even then, with that with the with the previous years, I think I think it's quite easy to identify what you have to do in the day. So if we have to train in the morning, then uni in the day, training in the evening, it's very easy to hit that, hit that, hit that, and then you. You, you you just go go through it and and really there's no there's no other choice like you 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 want you to get your degree you want to swim fast so yeah you, you do the work for the degree you do the work to swim fast it's kind of t- takes care of itself yeah. you find a way to make it work i guess and previous guest on the podcast footballer jake jervis told us that he had a, a color-coded calendar and i suppose what you're saying here is the key to managing both things is organization and yeah. planning certain times to focus on certain things. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think because the um academic and the swimming calendars also kind of fall that we would race we'd have a targeted meet in December, then January exams, then trials in April, then summer exams, then summer nationals. So they then kinda of, you can put put kind of the, the uni kind of just on a like just keep it ticking over while you go into that national meet hit that and then right all in on the exams and the swimming kind of not re- not necessarily fades into the background but it's we you're then conscious of these three four weeks are learning weeks these are get get ready for the exams and then and then it's like right we've got uh whatever's whatever's coming up next fantastic so you probably don't get a huge amount of spare time or maybe you do a bit more now you've completed your masters but when you do, what is your version of downtime? What do you like to do to take yourself away from competing at such a level? I uh, I go I go through phases. Really, Some, sometimes I do listen, nothing. I just sit sit at home and wait till whatever I'm meant meant to be doing. Uh, I went through a phase of doing a load of you know, like killer sudokus. Mm-hmm. So I went did was just doing yeah a lot a, a lot of them. I did uh, kind of. Yeah, picked up projects where I think, oh, I'll make a when we're in when we're in lockdown, I'll make a football goal for for a garden and that. So is that I'll just build that. So so at the minute, I've kind of kind of fixated on building a. It's called a power tower. So it's like a, if you imagine in the gym like a cable stack yeah. mm-hmm. where you've got like yeah yeah like a cable machine. It's like that, but for swimming. So there are companies that that build them, but they're just so expensive. And then come from America, so you have to pay import and then VAT and all. Like the cost adds up, so I thought, well, I'm going to have some time off in the, in the summer. I'll, I'll build my. Oh wow, I won't bother waiting until then. I'll just 
try and build build one now. So it's gonna be like a yeah a, a frame and a bucket that then kind of figure out how to loop some pulleys around so that it will go 15 meters uh, 25 meters without obviously the bucket having to go up f- 15 yeah. meters so that's kind of a uh, yeah yeah pro- project at the minute it's probably it's coming across here that it just takes your brain to a different place it's something so far removed from swimming from studying that it just allows you to really focus on that and that that's a great way to allow your brain to kind of replenish so you feel fresh ready for swimming again yeah i think i think so i think so because the kind of the 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 swimming yeah takes takes so much f- focus while we're we're there at, at the pool that that to so do something outside of the pool that's not going to detract away from the swimming so it's not like um i don't know something dead active or or something that's going to mean the swim performance is going to suffer but it's yeah something to t- take the mind away yeah i think i think, I think it's uh I, th- I think it's needed to be honest in yeah for. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like you just said there as well, it's it's active enough to still be doing something, but at the same time, you're not going to experience some kind of burnout as a result from your from your hobby as well as from your training. Every guest that comes on is is now exposed to our random question generator, and yeah. you're no different, Jamie. And Katie, you better listen in here because you're going to have to also chip in with your answer. Maybe I will. Um, so, Jamie, please, can you pick a number between one and thirteen? I'll go, for, I'll go for a lucky 13, please. Right. Okay, so this is a new question yeah. into our bank. What would be your choice to sing on karaoke? Oh, no. I'm not I'm not much of a singer. Uh, have uh, a think for a second. I know what Katie's going to say, I think. I don't think you do. Oh, go on. <laughs> well, I've never actually done karaoke, and it's one of my uh, one thing to do before I'm 30. So I've got 10 things to do, but th- this, th- this is one of them. Um, but no one will do it with me. Um, but it's actually, I'm quite an ABBA fan, so it'd be Dancing Queen. Okay, yeah. I could see that being one that gets gets people going yeah. in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we need to have a staff night out and a few colleagues might join you on the mic. Is that you? Yeah, I'll give it a go. No problem. <laughs> I mean, mine would probably be something like, um, something 80s as well, maybe something a bit cheesy. A bit of Billy Ocean, maybe. Love oh, yeah. Really Hurts Without You. Yeah, it's a feel-good song, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. And it definitely wouldn't be something like a Whitney Houston thing. <laughs> There's absolutely no chance of me hitting those notes. Jamie, uh, you've had time to consider your response. I'll what would you for, choose? So, I'm, like I say, I'm not much of a singer, but I'll, I'll, I'll sing in a car if I'm on my own. <laughs> so I'll do uh, uh, The State of Massachusetts by Dropkick Murphys. Okay. I'll do that one, because that's uh, up, upbeat and kind of... It's like Irish, Celtic rock, so it's... Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I'll go for that. You can I really know, belt I the, out. To I, know, I know the words, so that that helps. <laughs> so if someone's uh, driving past you on the motorway and, and sees you singing your heart out, it's probably going to be. Could, it could be. It could be that. that. It could be that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Jamie and, and Katie as well. Right now, we're going to get our game face back on, and we're going to ask you, Jamie, to share what what you think we mean by the phrase "performing under pressure." Yeah, I think that's that's about delivering the. Um, performance that you've kind of worked for, um, delivering that ideal performance at the at the time that you need to deliver it. So it's about I'm hearing a like a, um, an an emphasis there on training. So it's been able to execute your training, not just necessarily day in day out, but really when it properly counts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think because your your training kind of sets up the habits, um, like your f- physical and your mental habits, and then so that when you come to that, I would say call it that high pressure environment, that that environment where this is your one chance. So in, in swimming, we tend to have one meet that qualifies you for the championship, or if you're at the championship, you have heat semi final, but there's only that one final that's it and for me 100 flies over in 51 seconds so it's you've got yeah it's delivering that in that at that exact time Mm -hmm. to to uh yeah to get that performance you've been you've been working for for half a year two years four years whatever that it's kind of on on 14 years however long that is kind of ongoing 
I suppose like it sounds like quite a high risk, high reward kind of moment, very quite a challenging moment. And like to, it sounds like there's a lot of expectation and a, like it feels like a lot of demand on yourself to be able to perform at an at your optimum in that one moment, and then that's kind of like your one chance. I suppose my question to you now is, do you enjoy that pressure? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, f- I think being in that environment where you have to perform um yeah i, th- I think that, that brings out the best in me uh, i think racing it's easy to race fast when you're against other fast people because you 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 have to it's like if we if we do like a, a local race where i know i'm gonna win obviously it's, it's more you're more relaxed going into it but then the time is never going to be as fast as if you're head to head with someone having to get your hand on the wall first mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think I, think I, would, I enjoy it. I think I swim well under that pressure, obviously apart from the the most recent. Yeah. Do you, when you talked about like, um, you're obviously more confident in maybe races where you, you know you're going to win. Is it? Do you enjoy that pressure more than the pressure where maybe you're the underdog or maybe you're well matched with everyone? Like, is there a difference in enjoyment there? Um, in terms of the the race itself, I think going, I like going into a race thinking, right, let's see, let's see what I can have here. Yeah. Um, so that's was quite good when when I raced at the at the World Cups, because a lot of the a lot of the the, the best in the world are, are there. So it's like oh, I'm next to, you might be next to whoever is a a world champion, a world medalist, whatever. And you think, well, yeah, well, let's see, let's see, let's see if we can a- a- attack him here. Yeah. Yeah, quite. I like that. I like that. I think, yeah, where it's like that pressure environment, but there's no, there's no expectation necessarily on my performance. Yeah, it's just going and go in and race, yeah. and then see see Wait, what we yeah. can what we can do. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I, mean, I suppose talking about those um, kind of those sources of pressure, you, you spoke about um, expectations on yourself, for instance. Um, what are kind of the other main sources of pressure that you come up against? Uh, I, th- I think mo- most of it is um, an, an expectation. I think from from me. Um, obviously, you've got you've got f- friends and family that are kind of that they're not necessarily putting saying to you, "Oh, you have to do well here," but you 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 feel like a almost like an obligation to perform because they've gone through it with you. And same same like with coaches, and like you you want that. You want that final swim to be a reflection on the work you've done, um, which, which often often is the case. Like when you swim well, you you know it's because you've put in that work. You've everything's gone into that. Whereas then, if it's a if it's a if it's a poorer swim from the outside, if you just looked at the results, it looks like you've maybe sacked it off for half a year or or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, so I think I think that's kind of the main. Thing. And then, and then with with swimming with these trial meets is is that kind of um, desire to to qualify for a team, mm-hmm. um, which obviously you, you have that one yeah that one swim to 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 make it, and that that as a as a kind of as that reward, mm-hmm. I think en- ends up adding adding some pressure to that. So just to reiterate, so it's kind of the the outcome, the expect the expectation from yourself and the expectation from others. But not from them saying anything, just from they've been there with you for yeah. that whole journey. They've put a lot of effort in. They've really supported you. And you just want to do them proud. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I suppose thinking about those other people, such as your coaches, uh, your friends, your family, has anyone influenced how you th- how you think about pressure and uh, and the way you think about it? Um, a bit. I think so. My, my coach, Mark Rose, is... Is, is into big into like kind of psychology stuff. Um, so when, when, I, when I talk there about like let's go and let's go and go and attack him and and, and see what we can do, that's kind of comes from coming from him as a that's like kind of what he he's all about. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that. Let's go and let's go and t- take it to them rather than going into arena and it's yeah feeling timid or or anything like that. It's like kind of that that fra- framing of it, I suppose, is yeah. is then different. Difference. So it's a framing to be on the 
front foot and embrace that pressure. I think rather than rather than just being there and it being overwhelming. Yeah, I like that the, the connotation of embracing pressure rather than something that you need to reduce or avoid or run away from. Like you're never gonna yeah. you're never gonna you're never gonna race a race without an element of pressure. Yeah, and that ultimately maybe helps you. Yeah, I think so. And then we've we've worked with. Um, uh, th- through through swimming at Manchester, we worked with a, a psychologist called Dr. Bruce Laurie, and uh, he's we've done we've done a lot of like on like uh, self talk with him and uh, like um, uh, kind of like a, a pain management during racing. And one of the things he talks about is how how n- nervousness and excitement is the same thing, but it's but it's the f- the framing is is different. So if you go into it saying to yourself that you're nervous then that's gonna your thought is nervous your your outcome is then much poorer than if you're i'm excited i'm ready to race and then and then it's more relaxing and then you can can deliver that Mm -hmm. so it sounds like in in bruce's work a, a key part of that is reappraisal it's been able to see these stress responses as not signs of danger it's to see them as signs of readiness yeah, and if you can keep reminding yourself of that, then it's going to put you in a better place to perform well. I want to ask you a quick follow-up question on on what you just said in response to Katie there about pain management. Yeah, it's not a topic that's cropped up yet on the on the podcast, so I'm interested to explore that a bit further. So obviously, you have to push your body to the limits day in day out um, in your training. You get up early in the morning. Yeah, everything is all geared up to being an absolute machine so that you can be one of the best swimmers in the country and naturally that's going to lead to feelings of pain tiredness and how are you in your training psychologically trying to prepare yourself for that pain yeah so so when we talk about kind of and and bruce was about yeah pain is pain mass pain mastery rather mm-hmm. than pain management i think that's it misspoke there that's an important distinction because we're not yeah. we're not trying to cope with the pain we're in control of it mm-hmm. right and we we ma- we master that so and it kind of stems from when i race when you race 100 meters you you kind of you get that lactic acid build up mm-hmm. by probably 75 by about with that 25 meters to go you're in you you, you know you've swum yeah. 75 meters and but bruce, bruce's thing is he says well do you think the guy in the lane next to you is experiencing that pain? And you go, probably, yeah. What about the guy on the other side? Yeah. So so rather than it being, here comes the pain, it's everyone's in pain. Here's my opportunity to to make a difference. So it's so it's kind of, again, when we're talking about that reframing, it's this is, it's, it's not, oh no, here's some pain. It's, oh yes, here's some pain. Here's my opportunity. Here's where I'm going to make a difference. Uh, and then because that is a there's no way you you can do that if i just said to you that now then you went and did a race whatever whatever sport you might be in there's no way you can do that straight away so that's got to be that's a trainable skill that then when we're in the train and you're doing the the hard sets because the the sets are always going to be harder than a race in terms of the they they last for longer you've got more reps so if you can kind of kind of practice that skill of mastering the your pain and it being a um it being something you can just you you swim through anyway because that's your opportunity to improve then then uh, that transfers then in, into the race and it's much easier to do in the race and much more automatic in the race i love the points you made there about this being a trainable skill that you can learn to see pain as not something that's um necessarily a problem but probably a sign that you are, that you are pushing your body that you are performing well and telling yourself that other people are also experiencing that so i guess what that might look like in practice then is that you might have some kind of group or individual session there's a bit of education piece around that and then the onus becomes on to you to tell yourself these things while you're training and while you're racing it, have I summed that up? Yeah, fairly? yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So with with Bruce, we've written we've written a script. Um, so it's not. I don't like it um, being really strictly like concrete written in, but I like uh, 
I like, yeah, I like kind of like that acknowledgement is my opportunity, and then and then drive essentially. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Like we spoke about it in a group or or one one to one. We've done some one one to ones, and then yeah, then it's on it's on us then to put it put it into practice. Brilliant. I mean, you're really talking our language, and it shares so many parallels with the work that we do. Love the word about acknowledging it as well there that's the first kind of step isn't it you've got to recognize what's going on to then interpret it in a positive and helpful way just going a bit further with the script then so um is this something that you write down and read or do you kind of type it up and and then record it as a as an audio file how does the script kind of um element work for you mine's a, a write it down um yeah, because again, this is a a Bruce and a Mark thing though. That that if you've written it down rather than typing it, you've got a bit more of a um, a connection to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So so write it down in obviously so that it's there in your handwriting. Um. And then I'd I'd read that maybe in the afternoon before before we go to training or pre pre race and kind of just so it's just so it's there and accessible i think more than more than anything it's 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 there so it's automatic it's just it just comes where you here's some pain yeah here's some pain great here's here's my opportunity to to succeed and it sounds like you're making this really um personal to you and probably the writing element allows it to feel even more personal than yeah yeah if you were just given a script exactly yeah you you write it and you use words that are y- yours yeah um so so the words bruce uses for his explanation will be have the same meaning but be slightly different to the words i'm using will be different to what my teammates are might might be using yeah this is all really interesting and i'm loving this different angle about pain mastery it's like i said it's not been a topic that's cropped up on the podcast let's now focus a little bit on the night before because athletes often tell us that you know they might struggle to sleep before a big event and the night before is an, an important part of being able to perform under pressure mm. so if you want to give a specific example of swimming at the world cup or the national championships or the commonwealth games what kind of things are you doing the night before a big race the next day a lot a lot of that i think comes to come back to routine um so there's no same as we say with the with kind of that pain mastery is that you practice it to deliver it when it when it matters there's no you're not going to be able to do something radically different on that night before racing compared to so say we do we go f- something fast every saturday morning friday night then has to have a that normal preparation to be able to deliver on the saturday that's the same then when we come to racing if we race on whatever the day of the week it might be, so you race Thursday, Wednesday is still then got to be a in a position to make Thursday as fast as it's going to be in the same way that our training Friday into going into swimming fast Saturday. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's kind of eating the same um, same hydration, going to bed at the same time with with an, an with an acknowledgement that. You might not be able to sleep because you're excited, but if you can acknowledge that, and again, you you think, well, probably everyone else is struggling, and are you gonna are you gonna be in the best place if you're worrying about not I can't sleep yet, or are you the best if you go I can't sleep but I will, and I'll breed for a bit or I'll just just lie lie in the dark and then eventually you're gonna gonna fall asleep. We kind of had the have the slight difference in the actual routine when we're swimming is that we uh we we shave down so we shave all our body hair off mm-hmm. so that then happens that night before as well it's kind of the an unusual but and it but again that help that that kind of adds to that excitement because you it feels different mm-hmm. and you feel yeah. and you know this this is this means that the the meat is is here mm-hmm. um but yeah, I think I think r- routine really is is kind of key to f- fall back on. Like the the more robust the routines are, the 
the the easier it is then that nothing essentially nothing changes yeah so no matter what level the competition whether it's perhaps a more local meet or whether it's an international level meet essentially you're following the same kind of recipe the night before to keep things consistent and to stop it to stop it i suppose giving even more meaning to an event that doesn't even need that more meaning yeah i think so i think so and and i think the that that night before as well is where you can be um a bit more mindful of the the planning of like maybe logistics for the next day if you if you if you happen to get athlete shuttle buses that go at whatever times and just knowing that knowing what time you're gonna eat what time you're gonna get in the warm-up uh what time what time your race is that kind of thing that if you can cement that that night before as well maybe write out a timeline and then so then when you come to that next day you're physically prepped you know what you're doing there's no kind of panic around that yeah that's really similar to myself on a day-to-day basis i really like to know what i'm doing at what time because i don't like the uncertainty of not knowing that it's a controllable factor right yeah absolutely and that and that any bit of bit of stress is going to detract away from your performance or or in your day-to-day life if you're yeah flustered about going into whatever you're meant to be doing that day it's not going to be as productive as it would be down again it can end it can detracting from the from the sleep itself and 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 i know that so i I did a training camp in in hawaii back end of uh 2022 came came back and then was racing our short course nationals the kind of a few days later my jet lag was uh all over the place so so like so i I was awake at three in the morning and just awake yeah and then we we race heats and then finals at night but it's kind of but i swam swam really well and i I think just being aware of well i've not i've not slept but it it doesn't matter like i've I've had some sleep Mm -hmm. and and what what can i do now to Mm. to to still swim fast and i think knowing that and especially now with 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 swimming that our our races when we come to these big meets our, our races in a final might be quite late so at trials we were uh, like about seven eight o'clock something like that and if you're having taking caffeine yeah. till to to aid the racing then it's it's quite um common to, for you to be there at 11 o'clock mm. wide awake mm. but again you're you're not going to fall asleep any faster by yeah. worrying yeah. um so like and like you said about being in that state of rest mm-hmm. even if you're not asleep if you're resting that's good enough that's as good as it's going to be without you sleeping isn't it so yeah we can't control our sleep level 100 percent. there's loads of things that we can do to influence it mm. like trying to have the routine trying to make like a good sleep hygiene climate in, in our bedroom but we cannot force it 100 percent. and recognizing that's really important yeah. i think Let's move now to kind of the 30 minutes or so before. Maybe let's go with the Commonwealth Games as an example here. <laughs> you know that you've got friends and family watching. There's, um, it's been beamed around the world as well with the TV crews. So take us into that last 30 minutes. How are you preparing to perform well in those final stages? So in that 30 minutes before the race, so kind of... If you think about like the the racing timeline, I like to finish the warm up about half an hour before we before we race, and and again it goes back into that um, routine that I know that I get out the wa- get out the warm up. So there's often there's often a, a separate pool for like a warm up and cool down, so you can be so you can you can warm up ex- exactly when you want to rather than say there's having to do it before the session and waiting two two and a half hours three hours whatever it might be. Um, so again, yeah, just fall fall into the the routine. So I know I get out. I need to put the uh, racing trunks on. I know I need to do the pre race activation, and then go around to the cool room. And it's kind of they they end up being like step by step by step. There's not a lot of time really to start overthinking, which is which I think is pretty um, y- useful in that. Yeah. Um, and then and then really it's just, just thinking about that race plan um and kind of kind of mulling that over and knowing knowing what you're about to go and 
the the way you're going to swim, which is then going to lead to the um, out, outcome that you w- want to have. Mm-hmm. So when you're thinking about your race plan, are you kind of picturing yourself um, executing that in your head? Are you saying things out loud verbally or just tell us a bit more about this element of thinking about your race plan? Yeah, so I mean, immediately before it's kind of um, been aware. So, so when I when I swim, the kind of the more um, emotionally calm I am, the the better I'm gonna be able to swim. Um, some 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 people will be they they swim better by like getting themselves worked up, um, but kind of just don't just don't don't work for me. Um, so so it's kind of so I don't want to be thinking. So so we talk there about uh, kind of visualizing so we've done like imagery um and before but that's kind of a I, I tend to not use that on the on the day um but yeah so so it's more like a so some of its cues like a like a relax or like a maybe a focus on the breathing um like mark's quite big into square breathing and um, so we do may, maybe some of that but yeah Really, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like a couple of cues, maybe like relaxed, long, strong, big, those kind of words, and then uh, yeah, then, then that's it about, about it. Yeah, we had uh, sports psychologist Dan Abrahams on the show a few episodes ago, and he talked about the use of action words, and I think that's what you're saying here is that you use action words as reminders, as cues, because it's going to help you execute that exact word. Yeah, and and I think that's quite a, it's quite an empowering thing. If you're thinking about being tall and powerful, your 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 posture might change. Your every, that kind of every you have that physical re- reaction to that. Yeah, ju- to just a, a, a couple of words. And it, uh, the beauty of that, I suppose, is is its simplicity, mm. because they're not complex words. They are positive, helpful words that help you, as you said, feel empowered ready to go out and perform. Sometimes um, the performance that we want doesn't happen, and this is a, a tricky question to ask you yeah. now. I think you know this is coming. Um, recently you um, attended the British Olympic trials to um, have the opportunity to swim at the Paris Games. Mm-hmm. You fell a little bit short. You finished uh, seventh there in, in the final trials, and... I think it's really useful to unpick that a little bit, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. So let's start, first of all, by um, focusing on that particular moment, and then I'll ask you maybe to talk about how you've reacted to it since. Yeah. So I know from, from chatting to you that you felt that your start maybe was a problem in that trials, and you were kind of playing catch-up in that race as a result. So you probably knew that you'd made a technical error yeah. at the start, during the rest of that race, what were you doing or saying to yourself to try and get yourself back on track in the moment? Yeah, so so I'll take it I'll take it back a bit. So we raced in um Luxembourg in January and uh kinda I, we we raced there and I, I was kind of aware that um I didn't have much practice of being behind people. So like when we when we train um I'm, I'm normally I'm I'm the fastest in our in our squad, but particularly with um, when we train short course, my kind of push off and underwater is a is a is a strength of mine. So I'm never I'm never really in a situation where I'm behind and having to be aware of being behind, but s- stay calm and still deliver. Because it's very easy to go, oh no, I'm behind and sn- snatch the kicks and you 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 go slower but try hardest then you drop off more so we kind of I, I ended up doing a lot of um getting getting some of the people from like the, the younger squad or other people in in my squad to put fins on and we'd race or they'd not race but they would they would swim at a pace that's just faster than I was swimming so so that I'm I'm being able to be that aware of being behind but knowing that that's that's okay um especially in the way i swim 100 fly my first 50 is um 
solid, but people there are people that take it take the race out a lot faster. But then my strength is in that second half, so it's kind of so we so we did a lot of that kind of work to um, practice being being comfortable, turning and seeing that someone's ahead, but still being able to then deliver the underwater and the breakout well, and then finish the race strongly so in that respect when i got to trials my dive was poor um and i've broken out and started swimming um behind behind people yeah i kind of reverted back to that that, that would that we'd worked on um so so it's with my house i was kind of saying to and it's, and it's hard to remember yeah. now what it was yeah, like in in the moment but but it, it was like yeah this is okay um uh, I know what this is like. Keep keep swimming how I swim, um, but I think uh, I th- but I think the thing that that, that kind of was the, was the worst for that it was just that it was the physical, just being being behind and getting the waves and to swim through that. Um, yeah, it was. It, but yeah, that and, and kind of reflect on that, it was, it was just more frustrating. You know like how uh, kind of we said earlier about the the race is kind of the reflection on the work you've done lead, leading into it and and my like my my heat was was really good like heat heat was half second faster than that final one it was like my third fastest swim ever and like i was in a good place to the the meet we'd done um pre like the meet we'd done two weeks before i was uh, about three quarters of a second faster from the heat to the final and so if I delivered that, so I knew that uh, another qu- like three quarters of a second drop, I'd be, I'd hit that qualifying time. Um, so I was so I was in a physically good place, and then the which was the most annoying thing is that I'd, I'd spent so much time working on the start because my start was a weakness anyway. Mm-hmm. Spent a lot of time making it better, uh, like the the hundred freestyle the day before. My start was was really good. The hundred fly heat the start was really good and then it's like the one time i needed it yeah. it it was uh yeah poor and maybe that was a uh, uh a nerves thing or a pressure thing and and i think that was kind of maybe that was an atmosphere over the whole race because as a race it was a lot slower than everyone probably anticipated um so maybe yeah maybe it's kind of that knowing knowing that at that point whoever won that was going to go it was kind of yeah maybe that kind of took away from everyone then yeah i think a real takeaway for me from from your really detailed answer and thank you for for giving that there is it's important to practice being in difficult situations so maybe like in football terms you might train to play with 10 men like as if you've had a had a player sent off because that's going to happen at some point and when it does happen you know that you're ready for it because you've trained written that's like you saying i need to practice being uh chasing somebody in a race yeah because when it does come when that moment does come you're you're ready for it how about in the subsequent kind of weeks um after that because you you trained so hard um really wanted to get to the paris games um were you were you experiencing any difficulties uh, how are you managing the fact that you'd just fallen a little bit short there yeah it was it was it was it was uh, it was it was difficult. Um, yeah, I say because because there was that kind of um, anticipation of of delivering, and, and I think it's it's different, isn't it? If you if I was to swim well but get beaten, you think it's I've I've swum well, I've done what I can do, but because it was a because it came from a mistake, I think that's where that's where kind of it was it was hardest, and like the because that was on day my day two of the meet and I still was racing day three and day four and I just I just felt especially the the the, the day after I just felt I just don't want a beer mm-hmm. like uh, uh like what, what I was just, you just uh, behind the box think what what is the point mm-hmm. um which yeah it, it's hard and then it's kind of then I had a, a week off after that which was quite nice because I, I then spent a lot of time with a lot of mates of mine that I used to swim with that have since stopped and kind of just because they they get it but they're not really involved anymore so it was quite nice to go and see go and see some of them and then, and then it's really it sparked a bit of a different different um approach to our, our training 
Um, so I've kind of dropped the number of sessions from, from nine a week to six and then done, doing more kind of on land outdoors, like a lot of walking now. Um, uh, and then and then so there so then we the train's that that bit different and we're racing ne- next week in in Rome so that's kind of kind of kind of it's kind of like a refocus to make that make that almost like the the redemption meet um but it's but it's hard what's hard as well is because obviously with the olympics being every every four years it's hard seeing now and thinking what's it gonna be like in four years time it, it seems like a long a long way away now um to get so that is the that's the pinnacle of of, of our sport mm-hmm. i mean like yeah to, to overcome something that was probably you know probably your ultimate goal possibly to be honest um it certainly would be mine if i was at that standard um yeah. But I think like the element that came out there was the importance of the social support and the support network around you. Like the fact you had a week off and then it was going, you know, you out to go and see, see your friends. And like that's such an important part about dealing with, with kind of something like that is to take yourself out of it, but still be able to talk to talk through yeah. it. Is that right? Are you kind of talk, yeah. Talk I think I think so. Just just kind of yeah, and 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 it kind of being um, obviously you have a bit of that kind of just offloading some kind of feelings but then you then to then c- come back and think of more of a well what 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 can we do differently then mm-hmm. now what kind of find a s- solution to to that yeah, yeah. um so yes yeah, so we're doing a lot more a lot more starting drills now and stuff stuff like that um, but yeah but yeah like being able to i think being able to talk to people that yeah that that understand it but are not Entrenched, it's yeah. it's. I think because they've they've got still got them that different perspective as well. Yeah. In that, in that, I'm there thinking this is the this is the end of the world. This is like, yeah. this is like yeah, kind of undermine my whole swimming for the last, mm-hmm. definitely the last two years. And they say, well, you know, it's it's this is what it is. It's part it's of the journey. Almost, almost like it's it's just swimming, like it. Obviously, it feels much more than that, but it is still sw- swimming. Yeah, yeah. And like you, yeah. Yeah, no, I can't. Yeah, I suppose that's yeah. So that's another point that's quite important, I think, for anyone listening is that thing of still talking to people that kind of understand it, but they have a step back from it. Because mm. then, as you said, that kind of gives it a number of a bit of perspective. Because you normally think to go and speak to your teammates or the other people on that team, but they're also very passionate about it. Yeah, very much in it. Um, which I suppose allows for they obviously understand it a lot more, but the other ones still understood it, but from a different from, yeah. f- from a different angle. So no, I, I really like that, and the fact that you've thought about you know, you've seen fa- you've seen that mistake or that failure and gone be- well, it's not going to stop me. I'm just going to reshift things slightly and learn from it and and move forward. Um, which is you know is always a really important thing about failure. We always learn so much more from our failures than our successes. Yeah, which so rings true with what 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 kind you're talking about there. So he's now moving away from you as um, as an athlete. Um, so you, you do a little bit of coaching with young swimmers. Can you talk us through your approach to helping them to perform under pressure? Yeah, so I'm so so as I'm. Get getting older, and uh, so swimming's weird in that you get some people out and they're just freaks. They can just swim really fast, and there's not really a reason why. Um, a lot they might be they might have like grown and they might be massive and have massive hands and feet at 14, and they, that just means they can swim fast. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, kind of because my progression was a bit that bit slower, I didn't make like that Commonwealth Games was my first international team and I was 24 so a lot of swimmers have kind of yeah made made like junior teams and then but then struggle then to do anything as a senior because they don't necessarily know how to train hard they don't know how to live with that kind of lifestyle whereas I feel like because I've had to figure out Mm -hmm. how to swim fast and how to perform that that I've got a lot of kind of knowledge that I can pass on so kind of what i'm what i'm trying to do now is like some mentoring or like uh club visits if i talk just think about trials i had a um 
club visit in Peterborough the day after trials finished. And then that was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm driving to that thing. Oh Christ! <laughs> but but that's good because they're they're kids. They're not they they don't care. Yeah. They, they want to learn how to swim. They're there to learn how to swim butterfly and to hear a bit about kind of my path, path through the yeah. sport. So so yeah. So so just try to do to do stuff like that with um, and kind of yeah, kind of answer questions with them and like trying to give them other things and and for their coaches as well that they and think of like different ways of um a, approaching a certain skill maybe that they don't know about that kind of m- makes sense um yeah so so like so yeah so when i when i've done like some mentor and one of the lads i was kind of talking to and he's 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 one of them who's he can go out fast and then die at that back end of the race and he, we, when we were just having a, a, a chat, and he said, "Oh, I can just, feel, oh no, here comes, here comes the lactate, and it's hard." And kind of had the similar conversation to we had about that kind of pain, mm-hmm. pain mastery, and kind of being uh, acknowledging it and then push through. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the things that I've picked up on or been taught, I, th- I think I yeah, just try and pass, pass, pass that on. Mm-hmm. I suppose uh, you know trying to trying to change the way they think so they also have so he's an athlete in a way so it's probably stepping back now as from my consultancy approach but like you probably get more buy-in because you've been there done it yeah. brought the t-shirt whereas i'm probably sounding off and they're like you're not in my position or you're ne- you've never been in my position yeah it, it, exactly i think i think like so, so say if we race uh regional championships and i can win the 100 fly by four or five seconds then that has then a big impact on oh what, why is he so fast compared to yeah compared to like if if it's their coach who's i don't know in his 60s and he's and he's just telling them the same thing and i think for them hearing it from someone else yeah makes a makes a difference i did with the with that same same lad with he's doing backstroke and uh, it's kind of his chin was quite uh towards his chest so he ends up sitting up in the water and uh so i was talking, telling him about uh putting the chin back but we talk about having a long a long spine a lot mm. of the time so you're not necessarily thinking about the chin but you have that long long spine and then he was doing that and his dad says to me well his two coaches at his club have told him that for the past year <laughs> and he's not done it I said like, yeah but some, sometimes it is hearing it from someone different or in a different way yeah 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 can, uh, can, can yeah, again up making a big difference yeah yeah no that can ring true especially like if it, when it's said slightly differently I mean I've been in those situations when learning something but when someone says it yeah. in your terms or just just like in that slight different way I'm like oh yeah okay I kind of get this a bit more now um, I suppose on, on, on the line of that and, and on the line of coaches what do you think are some of the important things that as a coach, they should probably avoid saying to that athlete that might undermine their performance under pressure. Um, that's a good question. I think there's a probably, probably a few. I, th- I think focusing on an on an outcome is probably um, uh, not not beneficial, especially mm-hmm. because because most of the kids are younger. Like if you're in your if you're in your teens, like your your whole swimming life. Is the the ideal would be they keep swimming to well throughout f- forever, but keep mm-hmm. racing forever, like you can still race masters, whatever, and, and, and enjoying it. Um, so what? So I think so I think that if you if you if a coach focuses too much on that result rather than the kind of the, the way you swim it, mm-hmm. um, and I think as well with Mark we always talk about what we what we're going to do, not what we're not going to do. So I think if you if you say his example is if I say to you don't think of a pink elephant <laughs> yeah. in your head is now just a pink elephant so so if we say don't tuck your chin all you're thinking about is tuck tuck the chin yeah. if you like if you're in a race and you say don't breathe all you're thinking about is breathing's just going through your head so if you say I'm going to keep swim with a long neck I'm going to keep the arms relaxed on this recovery mm-hmm. the you end up then yeah being able to deliver that kind of a bit. Mm-hmm. a bit better so it's so just to kind of recap that so it's not focusing too much on the outcome 
yeah. sort of like the you must win or you we'll must score this. Yeah, we'll say, yeah, focusing on that process of the, the, process of the swimming. Of the, yeah, of the actual race. And I suppose just racing well, what's what's your race? Is that more... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind, of, yeah kind of like you... Yeah, because they, they know with the athlete what they kind of what their areas of improvement are yeah so you want to see them in the in the races and yeah. then so that then in the next big meet or in a year's time at the big meet they've put putting that in with the that extra year's training and then the time then drops yeah yeah kind of takes takes care of itself yeah yeah okay so focusing on the processes and then the other one was not to think like don't do this just focus on the things you should be doing like yeah do this yeah things you are going to do yeah. yeah yeah which makes a lot of sense with a pink elephant i use that analogy a lot so yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's certainly it's you know it, it definitely rings true um i suppose now coming you know we've talked about younger athletes here but now talking about you as a younger athlete is there any advice you would give your younger self about performing under pressure uh i think i think i would say the same as i kind of try and think now which is like just go and, go and enjoy racing mm-hmm. like like i said like your your swimming is not defined by that one race at 18 say i say like when i was trying to make european juniors and didn't and it was like oh no and like and that was kind of like again that was kind of like almost too much outcomey kind of focused yeah i think just go and go and enjoy swimming like you you enjoy swimming you're gonna be doing it for a long time Go and enjoy racing, and then the yeah, the the outcome will 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 come. Yeah, so I was just thinking about the longevity of yeah, the journey I rather so. than oh, I just got to win this race, got to win this race, got to win. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, nice, and finding that enjoyment and that fun out of the sport because it's ultimately why you started it in the first yeah, place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, why you started it. Um, okay, yeah, no, that's that's nice. I like that. Um, if you had. Um, to leave the listeners with one takeaway message to help them to perform under pressure, what would it be? Um, I'm trying to, try to think what we kind of. I, th- I think I think I think I'll say, get your routines. I think if you set set your routines um, while you're training, so that when it comes to that race day, the routines are automatic. You've got that kind of autonomous process, um, and then the the performance will naturally happen because you've everything's you've you've ticked off all the 10 things you would normally do and so naturally the performance is going to be at that at that level you want it to be brilliant thank you for sharing all all what you've shared jamie and we'll invite you in a moment to come back in with any final uh, comments or remarks we're at the stage of the podcast now where um myself and katie will kind of highlight three things that have stood out for us today uh, I'll let you go first, Katie, and then I'll chip in with my three and then we'll bring Jamie back in one last time. I think I might be nicking yours here or one of yours. I've got some others up my sleeve. Go okay, on, that's say okay. what you want to say. <laughs> it's actually probably around the um, the pain mastery. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this because actually I drew it back to um, the junior athletes I sometimes speak about, speak to, and they're rowers and they do a 2K, a 2K test, which builds up a lot of that lactate. And... Um, that thing of like they tend to pain catastrophize which i think you obviously do the opposite of that so pain catastrophize i mean like they'll go oh i can feel pain does this mean i'm weak do i need to stop is there something wrong that so they'll, they'll catastrophize about what they feel whereas you saw pain as something like i'm going to acknowledge it's there but i'm going to see it as a cue and like an opportunity how can i best move forward now i'm going to use it to push off because everyone else is kind of feeling the same i'm going to use this opportunity to show what i can do is that kind of uh, okay um so i really like that and so i've written down the keywords acknowledge opportunity drive which you used um so that's certainly something i'll be taking away i uh, really really like that aspect the other thing um it probably comes from my performance lifestyle kind of role i really liked it's going back to the beginning but around the dual career um and I think as a lecturer, I'm probably going to say it as well. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that you can have both and still be successful in both. And I think it is so important. But then you also talked about after your university, having a hobby. Like there's another element, another yeah. identity to mm. yourself. You're not just a swimmer. Swimmer is a massive part of you, but you also have something else that you can go to and kind of take a break from. And I really like that. And the fact that actually the dual career when you were... Um, 
a student and a swimmer, it almost helps you to kind of timetable timetable your day almost. So, you know, you knew when you were swimming, you knew when you were doing your education and it almost felt like it kind of helped, almost helped performance in both areas. Um, So I really enjoyed that bit. And the the other bit or bits was, because it's probably my area, self-compassion, you talked a lot about common humanity. Um, and common humanity is that uh, that acknowledgement that, you know, everyone might be feeling a certain feeling or a certain way. And you talked about that in three aspects around pain like we've picked up on. But you also talked around that about sleep and it also made me feel like I don't sleep very well all the time. And I'm one of those ones who are like, I can't get to sleep. I can't sleep. I'm not going to be able to sleep <laughs> the rest of the night and that's going to affect me tomorrow. But I really like the aspect of actually we all have moments where we can't sleep and it's to acknowledge that and be like think a bit bit more rationally i'll probably still cope tomorrow and still get through the day um and the other one was the um the the, the hardness you talked about that in the last um in the way we didn't quite qualify and that actually everyone probably you acknowledge that everyone probably felt that that race was really hard and a bit slower than usual rather than just you know, you've come away from that rather than just focusing on yourself but the fact acknowledging that we all probably were in the same boat here um so I, I really like those kind of aspects yeah thank you for sharing all those Katie and I've still got plenty up my sleeve you haven't stolen all of mine here <laughs> but yeah um just to highlight my first thing here I think this is transferable to anybody whether you have got to deliver a big presentation the next day whether you're getting married the next day, um, that the night before a big event, keep things simple, keep things how you would normally keep them. Because if you start meddling about with that too much, then it can interfere with the next day. So the night before a big event, stick to your usual routine and don't do things that are too far removed from that. That's what I took from that. And I think that is a highly transferable point. My next point is about the um, mistake or the adversity of of not qualifying um, for the Olympics and seeing that as an opportunity to to refocus, in your words, I think you used that word there, um, an opportunity to reboot. Remember a previous guest we had on, England International, uh, cerebral palsy, um, Harry Baker. He talked about not making the squad for a major tournament and he saw that as a watershed moment in his career. And to cut a long story sh- short, it kind of made the next part of his career because he used that as as fire, as motivation, as an opportunity to kind of look at himself in the mirror, re-examine his attitude, I think he said as well at the time. And my last point as well is after a, a, a setback, just simply offloading how you're feeling as a form of what we might term emotional expression can be a great way it doesn't make the problem go away it's happened but it allows you to feel better and maybe it's a bit of a cliche that is true it gets it off your chest mm. and it allows you to process it and allows you to move forward because if you didn't it might be suppressed it might bubble away and you might not deal with it so just a simple fact of offloading two people who understand your situation but maybe slightly removed from your camp maybe that's the way to do that so i'll come back to you now jamie i'll ask you if there's anything else that you want to share or do you have any reflections on our reflections um no not really i I, I think you've done you well to kind of pick that out from my rambling (laughs) um no yeah i I think that's all kind of good very well kind of uh, succinct kind of picked out yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. Yeah, we've ca- we've captured your mindset and your yeah. psychology in a in a fair and yeah, usable way. There. Brilliant. Well, Jamie, I really appreciate you coming in today. You've come down from Manchester to our studio in Stoke. Thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for being so open in sharing some of your secrets of success. You know, you've competed at a really high level for a long time, so we can certainly take stuff from that and anybody can in any walk of life and thank you for being so open and feeling that you could discuss your um challenging situation that you'd had recently about the olympics i appreciate that 
Thank you as well to my co-host, Dr. Katie Sparks. Thank you for your reflections and your input. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Liam Kelsall, for your technical support. We'd be lost without you. And thank you to all our listeners. Um, Really appreciate the nice comments that you give to us on social media about the show. It's really interesting to hear what you're taking from it as well. So so do get in touch with us um, about that. And just on that, Jamie, if people wanted to reach you or if they wanted to follow your career, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, so there's a, there's a few. I've I've got my uh, Instagram is uh, jingram98. Mm-hmm. I've got uh, a YouTube channel, which is uh, Ingram Swimming. And I've got a website that's kind of got every, everything on it. So that's uh, jingramswimming.com. So probably, probably that's the best one. That's kind of like got the contact form and all that if... Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in anything. Okay. And on that website, am I right in saying that people have got the opportunity to have some performance analysis and coaching yeah. by yourself? Yeah, yeah. So so I've got um, kind of a, a race analysis set up. So, yeah, and that, that's dead simple. All you have to do is get someone to film your race for you um, and then you up, upload it. I end up sending you a Dropbox link. Upload it to that. I'll give you an analysis where it does splits, uh, stroke rates, stroke counts, kick counts, kind of those metrics that you can and then some uh, uh, technique kind of um, observations which then you can kind of monitor the metrics race on race mm-hmm. uh, and then s- similar with the technique kind of I'll, I can have a look at that and uh, give you give you drill suggestions or uh, kind of yeah just my thoughts on your your what your swimming looks like excellent well thank you for all that you've shared today and thank you everyone for listening uh, and until the next time That's a wrap today for Staffordshire University's Performing Under Pressure podcast.